I would also encourage uh, all of you to use the chat box as well as the CBSE blog for any questions that you have based on the inputs and the uh, opinions shared by both our speakers today. And uh, last, I wanted to bring your attention that tomorrow's Canada series is scheduled for 10 a.m. in the morning, keeping in mind the time difference between India and Canada, as tomorrow we have experts from the West Coast. And the West Coast has a bigger time difference between India and the West Coast. So tomorrow's session and Friday's session is at 10 a.m. We will begin the program now. Dr. Jen, is he here? Yes, I am here, Maria. Okay, sir. Uh, then I would request uh, Dr. Jyoti Gupta to uh, introduce Dr. Sandeep Jen from CBSE. Uh, good evening, everyone. Dr. Sandeep Jain, a very, very warm welcome to you and very warm welcome to the uh, panelists today, both uh, the panelists, eminent panelists, and uh, Dr. Jain is the uh, Joint Secretary at CBSC. He, uh, he holds a degree of PhD in psychology, uh, very, very passionate about inclusive education, has done a lot of work in CBSC around the inclusive education. Right now, he is the Joint Secretary trainings. And much of what is happening in these five days is under him and under Dr. Saha. So once again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jain, for giving all of us an opportunity to interact with the global leaders across the world and also for knowing from them as to how they are battling the situation and how they are inspiring the students and the teachers alike uh, to uh, go online and to take the uh, learning to the next level. So I request you to set the tone for today's session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. Thank you, Maria. And thank you very much, all the panelists. Good evening, all. Recently, the board has conceptualized professional development programs for the principals and teachers in collaboration with foreign institutes. Canada series Innovation and Inspire is one of the planned programs. Five sessions are scheduled from 20th to 24th July in this series. It is my privilege to commence session on the third day. Today's session is on transitioning to remote learning. So I thought that I should share my own experience. I'll start with a confession that neither I am a good techno savvy person nor I was interested to be. I love to take face to face training. I like to see the impact of my words, my sentences in the eyes of my participants. Observing changes in facial expressions, smiles, laughing, arguments, and changing my voice tone, posture, physical position, change in my engagement pattern as per the need, that was my style. And I believe most of the teachers do the same. But COVID has deprived me with this pleasure. It was like a punishment for me as I was not interested in virtual communication. April 2020 completely transformed my training experiences. Organizing and conduct, conducting virtual sessions and meetings are easy now. I took too much time to accept this change. However, there is only one basic difference between my pre-COVID and current training experiences, and that is my changed style of enjoying training. Nowadays, I enjoy my sessions like a RJ, radio jockey. Rest of the efforts are same like my flow of session, my planning for the engaging my participants, activities and assessment too. Storytelling was my favorite pedagogy in pre-COVID time. 
I use the same in current era too. Small adaptation can make huge impact. It was my experience. So my simple advice is accept and adopt. Thank you very much. Maria, please unmute yourself. Yeah, I realize. Thank you very much, Dr. Jain, and thanks, Jyoti, for pointing that out. And I think you have rightly said that uh, we have to evolve and adapt with the situation. So thank you for your comments, and thank you to all of CDSE leadership. So uh, greetings, everybody, once again. As Dr. Se uh, Dr. Jain said, today is the third session of CDSE Canada series, Innovate and Inspire. The last two days, we have approached the pandemic situation at a conceptual level. We started off with a panel discussion about what is the future of education in the post-COVID world. And then yesterday, we had a session about how schools should go about their digital transformation initiatives. In today's session, we shift gears and move towards practical solutions. Solutions that will help us transform these ideas into real action. Our session today is transitioning to remote or online education. And to share their rich experience with us, we have Ms. Michelle Fack, Executive Director, Open Learning and Educational Support, and Ms. Lena Kushner, Associate Director, Educational Technologies, both from the University of Guelph in the city of Guelph, Ontario. Our experts will talk about the consideration required for planning, creating, and implementing effective teaching strategies. They have tips for success in pivoting to remote teaching. They will share best practices in course framework with practical examples of transitioning curriculum to remote or online learning. Michelle Fack is the Executive Director, Open Learning and Educational Support. It's called Open Ed for short, at the University of Guelph. With over 30 years experience in educational administration, Michelle provides leadership to the university's distance education, continuing education, English language programs, and teaching and learning technologies. OpenEd's leadership in online learning, educational technologies, and program quality are recognized with awards from D2L, eCampus Ontario, Quality Matters, and CUAC. I will come to what CUAC is shortly. Michelle also serves as the chair of the D2L Research Innovation Guild. She is the past president of the Canadian Association of University Continuing Education, a national organization that advocates for the advancement of accessible learning opportunities for professional, adult, and diverse learning communities. Thank you, Michelle. She is joined in today's session with Dr. Lena Paolo Kushnit, the Associate Director of Educational Technologies in Open Learning and Educational Support at the University of Guelph. Lena directs the activities of teaching and learning technologies and classroom technical support, deploying educational technology services across the university and supporting faculty, staff, and students in their teaching, professional development, and learning. Lena's record of innovating teaching and pedagogy-focused research, her depth and breadth of expertise in pedagogy, effective use of educational technologies and expertise in scholarship to advance teaching and learning spans 29 years between the like you know between us the two speakers have a combined experience of 59 years so over to our distinguished speakers now michelle and lida Welcome, and uh, can you hear me, Maria? Great, thank you. Uh, welcome to everyone, good evening. I am uh, so very much thrilled uh, to be here with you this evening and to um, provide you with some of our 
uh, experiences and perspectives as we have at the University of Guelph moved to remote instruction. Um, so I'm just going to get started because I know we have a limited amount of time and I want to ensure that there's lots of time for questions. So just to kind of talk a bit about the agenda that we're going to follow in today's session. Lena, you'll switch the slides? Yep, it's just a bit delayed. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, I'm just going to give you a bit of context about the University of Guelph and Open Ed, uh, because I think that's really important in how we situate the, the conversation about remote instruction. And then Lena's is really going to talk to you about those practical pieces in terms of tips, best practices, um, and examples, and um, thinking about how to keep your students engaged. The University of Guelph uh, is located in um, Guelph, Ontario, which is a province within Canada. Um, it is about, as you can see here, it is about an hour away. The campus is about an hour away from Toronto. And we also have uh, another campus, which is located about an hour south of London, and that's called our Ridgetown campus. We are a top comprehensive and research institution. We were officially established in 1964. Um, we currently have seven colleges focusing on um, arts, business, physical science, life sciences, social sciences, but our roots are grounded in agricultural uh, and veterinary sciences as well as the McDonald Institute. We are, um, we serve over 30,000 students every year, uh, including our international students who come from over 120 countries. Open Learning and Educational Support is a centralized unit within the University of Guelph, and we support the academic mission of the institution in four areas, teaching and learning technologies, distance education, continuing education, and English language program. And all of those areas in our work, we work across a continuum of support and they're fully integrated. Um, our learners um, that we support include our traditional learners, our undergraduate and our graduate students, as well as our lifelong learners. Those are professionals working out in industry and looking to upskill and reskill as well as international students. We work across the continuum of programs and courses with all of our faculty and all of our departments, integrating technology and pedagogy in meaningfully and relevant learning to create meaningful and relevant learning experiences. And there's approximately 100 staff that are working within Open Ed to support the institution in uh, these experiences. We have years of experience uh, within our team. Um, our fully integrated approach, um, as you can see here on this slide, um, has instructional designers, technology specialists, techno technical designers, people that support our classroom technology, um, curriculum designers, support and quality assurance. So we've got years of experience in effectively integrating technology into courses in meaningful ways to achieve the um, learning outcomes. We um, are a member of Quality Matters, and Quality Matters is a US-based organization, peer-based organization that works to um, provide a, a framework for embedding quality um, in online and digital learning experiences. Technology and the innovative and effective use of technology is, in, is prioritized in the University of Guelph's teaching and learning plan in which there is a commitment to innovate spaces and technologies to enhance the learning experience. So we really, um, at the University of Guelph um, and within Open Ed, work uh, collaboratively to support um, the institution in advancing and um, advancing pedagogy and technical solutions and to um, providing uh, teaching excellence. 
We, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, D2L, uh, we, if you've uh, heard of D2L, it's a learning, uh, learning management system platform, Brightspace is another term that we use. We are actually D2L's first customer, and that really signals um, how we have um, been a leader in online learning for over 20 years, uh, where we work collaboratively with them to develop their environment um, to support faculty and students. And so um, we've really um, uh, thought a lot about this and um, are seen as leaders uh, within, um, within the province of Ontario, but also within Canada. We work, as I've mentioned, across the continuum of courses. So whether uh, we are supporting uh, faculty who are potentially just in the classroom and wanting to, um, you know, use very uh, classroom-based technologies such as projectors, um, but also faculty who are wanting to do more creative things, working within the learning management system, working with third-party technologies, um, to working um, with uh, faculty who are wanting to um, create blended learning opportunities and thinking about intentionally what activities we do in an online environment and what activities that we are going to do in a face-to-face -face environment to our fully online courses and which we work with faculty. We have a team of experts uh, where we work with uh, faculty who are the subject matter experts and are bringing that expertise into the course and we're, des we're designing a fundamentally different experience for students um, as they engage in a fully online, asynchronous environment. Um, so, in March, obviously, uh, when COVID um, uh, was really um, became prevalent in Canada, we, um, we had three weeks left in our semester. Uh, the university uh, indicated that the remaining semester and the final assessments would be done remotely. And so we really in open ed had to pivot and think about ways in which we were going to support faculty in getting through the final three weeks when they don't have a lot of time to think about any redevelopment or they just need to get the final three weeks of their content out. So we, our focus was on academic continuity, just helping faculty with a very very focused toolbox or toolkit of various, you know, technologies that they could use to either um, assess their students or uh, engage with their students. We didn't um, offer a whole lot of options because we really wanted to make it focused for our faculty um, because they, and as well as the students, would be overwhelmed and we really wanted to focus on the support. So. That's really what our focus was in the winter. It was really on academic continuity. As we moved to through after got through the semester and, and got into our summer semester, which is generally always offered online, so it's, it was a pretty typical summer semester. But as we plan for the fall, the university um, has um, indicated that the fall semester will be mainly remote. And so this is where we have shifted our thinking to be more about a facilitated support model in which we empower faculty to consider innovative approaches to um, teaching remotely. We've developed um, our website, which is the openedguoguelphca slash remote TL website, and I've listed it here and we'll list it again at the, pre at the end of the presentation. Feel free to go to that website. We've got a significant amount of evidence-based resources and approaches to help faculty think about how they might want to deliver um, their fall semester course. Um, we have also um, uh, engaged with 75 of our own University of Guelph students, brought them on board to help them work with faculty to also convert their, their course to our remote delivery, so taking some of that load off of the faculty and having those students, that student interaction, which also creates for a rich learning environment. And we've also, um, we also offer a number of webinars and workshops and uh, individual consultations. So we've, we've diversified our approach. We've evolved it to be more of a, a full, um, full perspective, giving faculty options um, and creative solutions 
to deliver a quality learning experience in the fall semester. I'm going to pass it over now to Lena, who's going to take it from here and um, talk about some of the practical pieces of this. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome. Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here with you. I'd like to uh, spend, um, take the remainder of the time that we have to first start off with very high level um, and broad ideas and tips and strategies um, that hopefully uh, you can take uh, away and, and use in your own uh, teaching strategies. Um, and then I'm going to drill down to very specific um, use case examples and we'll take a look at some of the technologies and I'll leave you with some resources that you can look at uh, later on in your own time. Uh, we won't have time to work through some of the worksheets that I sent ahead of time. Uh, for those of you who did not receive them, I will make them available again at the end of the session. So uh, once again, thank you. The goal of the remainder of the time is to really excite you and motivate you to um, go away and seek out solutions that really fit um, your specific uh, teaching and administrative contexts. So with that, I'd like to start off by giving you my top 10 tips for success in remote teaching and learning. And we'll just quickly go through very uh, briefly some, um, some tips on what I think you need to do to do well in this environment. And as Dr. Jin said, to evolve and adapt rapidly. So first and foremost, don't try to replicate exactly online what you normally do in your face-to-face -face, uh, settings. This is the number one mistake that many teachers make. And it simply comes down to the fact that things online uh, don't always, uh, or th sorry, things in face-to-face -face don't always transfer well online. Um, there's long delays in communication. Uh, typing often takes longer than it does to speak. So there's lots of factors that will um, just not transfer as well. Be prepared. Be prepared for some extra work. And this is true for both teachers and for students. It takes longer to type than it does to speak. And there are other factors. Reading generally takes longer than listening, and it's more cognitively effortful. So a number of factors uh, will, will seemingly um, make you feel like there's more information and uh, introduce some uh, overload, possibly. So you do want to be prepared for those um, different kinds of work and extra, kind, extra work. Be prepared technologically. You have lots of support around you. The school boards, this session, and the remaining, remaining sessions and the previous ones are all examples of the supports that your school boards have for you. Um, make sure you involve your, your educational technology support teams in advance while you're planning. And, uh, and making sure that you have the right equipment and the training and the skills to use the equipment. Once you've decided on tools, make sure that you have the right equipment to support those tools, not just yourself, but the tools. And as an example, if you plan on using videos, then you'll need um, computers and processing power that can handle those large files. So just a few uh, ideas there. Uh, another tip, take full advantage of your teaching and learning resources. You don't have to work alone in a bubble. There's lots of support around you, as I mentioned, within the school boards, and lots of support and resources outside of, um, of your school board, either on the internet, and as uh, Michelle mentioned, I'll be uh, leaving you the full URL for our support site. We welcome you to, um, to, to seek some uh, support resources there. Be open-minded. Remote teaching and learning is not for everyone. It is simply different. Um, social presence online is very different than face-to-face, -face, but it can be done and it can be done well. I'm going to leave you a couple of examples and show you some data from uh, some research we did in my laboratory to just show you just the impact that videos and, and your presence, just like we're all here together today in this live webinar, it can be very impactful. Um, there's a lot of positive and sometimes negative factors for both teachers and students, and it's balancing the positive with the negatives. Be organized. Be organized and be prepared to participate frequently, uh, particularly when you're, you're supporting students who might be using, um, you know, technologies at different times of the days and they might need, um, you know, flexible schedules and whatnot. Uh, students have different needs. Uh, we don't know what their home situation is and, um, you know, how well connected they are. Do they have good internet connectivity? Do they have uh, the right tools and access to uh, computers and devices so that they can connect with you? So really, there's uh, lots of different needs, different schedules, and we have to try to accommodate that. Um, 
But at the same time, you need to, as an instructor, uh, set the parameters. Set the parameters for your, for your students uh, and communicate very clear your expectations of when you will be online, how often you'll respond, uh, what your expectations are of them. This is really new for many of us, and we're all learning. Be a good writer. This is an important tip for both students and for uh, teachers. It's very important in a remote environment to be very, very clear, explicit, and concise. Uh, we often take for granted the affordances of our face-to-face -face environments, body language, reading the, the room um, when you see your students, walking by a desk and happen to, happening to catch uh, an issue that might be happening. That's all absent in the online uh, remote uh, environment. So being an effective, clear, concise writer will only help your students. Have a good roadmap, whether that is a course syllabus, a course outline, um, just have it available, easily shareable, and share that with your students. Share it with your students and share it with the families. Uh, especially for the younger students, they'll need a lot of support, um, and, and the parents, students, all involved will need to keep that roadmap close at hand so that they know exactly what your expectations are and what the paths and patterns are of your courses online. Set clear expectations for participation. It's really important that students and the families supporting them, especially the younger students, understand how you want them to participate, when and how, how often, uh, why, why you want them to participate in the ways that you ask them to participate. Understanding how their participation aligns with your curriculum and understanding how their participation is uh, assessed will add to the uh, success of uh, their remote experience and uh, your teaching online. My last tip before we get into other strategies and whatnot is eliminate distractions when teaching remotely. There are so many temptations and we're so tempted to multitask. We've got our cell phones, we've got the notifications for our emails coming on and off. It's really, uh, it's really important that you, you distinguish between the kinds of interactions uh, and distractions that are okay to have when we're teaching remote. So for example, if you're recording a video for a class um, activity, and family members or pets interrupt. Those kinds of mistakes are okay. It shows that you're human. It gives your students a little uh, peek or a lens into your life and how, how you're operating. Those kinds of mistakes are fine and you just go with it. You just roll with it. The kinds of distractions and mishaps that are gonna increase your workload and maybe won't be so okay is if you're trying to record a, a lesson for your students and your phone starts to ring or your email notifications start popping up, you might not feel so comfortable leaving those mistakes in. So my tip is turn off email, turn off the ringers on the phones and keep focused on the task at hand. You'll have a much better time of it and it'll be a much more successful experience for your students. Let's look at some uh, best practices in course design. And really, um, remote teaching and learning is often considered to be uh, somewhat isolating for students. And this is simply because of this perceived lack of connection um, compared to face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interactions between students and instructor, between students and students. But if you're able to, if you can arrange for regular opportunities uh, for interactions between students and between yourself and your students, then that perceived distance, that perceived disconnect, or that transactional distance is decreased significantly. The communication that you use in your course and the interactions goes way beyond just engaging your students. It also helps for you to provide very, very clear expectations of how and when you want students to, um, to participate. And it's about setting the path. It's about setting a path of how you want students to behave in the online environment. In a face-to-face -face course, that might be construed as babying your uh, students and, and giving them too much information and not giving them the autonomy to learn. That's not so much so in a remote environment. In a remote environment, by explicitly stating the path and the patterns of your course, what you're doing is you're really just you're setting the path in a clear way so that students aren't confused either by the environment or when they should be participating in what and completing an assignment, those sorts of things. If it's very clear out front, then the, um, the students can then just focus on the activities rather than getting lost in the environment. Some examples of um, connections that you might wanna try with your students. Weekly announcements. 
connecting with them. It could be daily announcements, depending on what your context is. Um, and these could be text announcements in your learning management system. Uh, it could be a video announcement. If you do a quick video announcement uh, that you can send out to students or post in your learning management system, that increases your social presence and makes you available to students. Um, discussion boards work really well to uh, communicate um, the expectations of the course. Uh, maybe you can use your weekly announcements or discussion boards to um, highlight important tasks for the day or the week, again, depending on what your context is. In my own courses, I teach um, first year and second year uh, psychology courses. In my own courses, I uh, will often record a video in the first or the second week of classes to describe to students what a typical week looks like. So for example, I'll explain that, well, you know, on Mondays and Tuesdays, you might want to consider reading these uh, chapters of the text. Um, you know, by Tuesday to Thursday, you should be uh, listening to the videos of uh, lecture material that I'm posting, you know, Thursday to Sunday, consider doing homework A, B, and C. By laying out that typical week, that pattern, your expectations, students have a much better uh, chance of success in learning in your course. Now, we also uh, need to consider best practices around teaching strategies. And when you're considering your teaching strategies, perhaps rather than trying to answer the question, you know, what modality is right for me? Should I go live synchronous like we are here today? Or should I go asynchronous, so a pre-recorded, not live, or an archived um, selection of course content? And really, after today, I hope that you consider a balance between the two, and, um, and not one or the other. What I recommend is that you let what you want your students to do, what are the behaviors you want them to have in your teaching and your courses, and how you want them to interact with your curriculum? What are those behaviors? What do you want them to do? Plus your instructional needs. What are your instructional needs? And then let the behaviors of students and your instructional needs guide uh, your strategies and the tools that you're going to implement in your courses. So let's consider briefly, what can you do in a live class? If you decide that you want to do your um, class and, and the materials that you're going to share with students, you want to do it live, for example, like in a webinar um, conferencing tool, what can you do? Well, there's lots that you can do, but here in the slides, I'm just going to point out a couple of possibilities. You can pair students off to work in groups using Google Meet or other tools that you might have available to you. You might have them collaborate. Um, for example, on a Google Doc, or again, in other shareable kinds of documents. A lot of your choices will depend on the tools that are available to you through your school boards, and how much autonomy you have in introducing new tools. So I won't make any assumptions about what you have or don't have available, but these are just some high-level broad ideas. If the tools available to you have um, items such as a whiteboard, you can have students work through problems together. You can use uh, discussion boards, annotation tools, have the students share their screen and be a teacher for a day. Have them teach to the students and share what they've learned. You as an instructor, you can show a video with some audio and then have students groups to discuss uh, whatever it is that you'd like them to discuss about the video. Lots of opportunities and lots of choices. If you decide that asynchronous, recorded, or archived kinds of um, uh, course uh, content is an option for you. What can you do here? Well, I'm going to show you four, um, four ideas or four tips that I have for asynchronous class options. And from number one to four, they increase in complexity, the skills required to be successful, and the amount of work and effort involved. The first two, voice over PowerPoint, or pre-recording your class in a web conferencing tool like we're doing here. So for example, this Google Meet live session is being recorded. If you do the same with your class teaching, you can then save it, and whether it's a voice over PowerPoint file or a link to a pre-recorded um, webinar session, you can then link those files or the recording link to the uh, web conferencing uh, session into your LMS. And that way, students can access with some flexibility at days and times that are convenient for them and their families. With increasing complexity, you have uh, other options available if you want to go asynchronous. Um, you can create lessons using an actual screen capture program, 
or you can um, use other interactive tools to uh, make the um, materials increasing, increasingly more interactive. Now, this does take more time and effort to plan. You require more skills to uh, work with these, um, with these programs, but these programs come with a host of features that allow you to do interesting interactive um, uh, types of uh, activities like embedding quizzes. So you might have a video playing uh, for your class lesson, and then during the video, a question pops up, the video stops, and now the student has to engage with that quiz. If your school board has access to, for example, Microsoft uh, Office tools, Microsoft Streams and Forms really facilitate this idea of embedding quizzes in your um, class videos, if that's an option for you. Anyway, again, I'd like you to think about a balance of asynchronous and synchronous. And when you're trying to decide on those strategies and tools, let your teaching strategies uh, be what uh, guides you. It's really, you know, there are lots of tools. Frankly, there might be too many tools and deciding in, um, how you're going to pick those tools can be quite challenging at times. So one idea is to my colleagues and, um, and students have often heard me say, for me, it's about putting the pedagogical horse before the technological cart. Let your teaching strategies and your pedagogical approaches be what determines your uh, tools and, um, and the guiding force behind how you're going to run your course. And there are lots and lots of possibilities. Again, it really depends on the tools that you have available to you. I know that Google Meet is a very lean and simple tool, but if you have other uh, web conferencing tools available, some of them come um, quite loaded with features like um, breakout rooms or whiteboards uh, and other interactive options. So it really depends on what is it that you want to do with your students and then mapping out whether it fits your, your synchronous plan, your asynchronous plan, and, and the tools that you want to use. And we'll have more on that in a moment. I do have some resources that I sent ahead of time. Again, if you haven't received them, we'll send them out again. Uh, but we have some resources uh, to help you plan, create, build, and implement uh, your remote courses. And uh, one example I'm going to share with you right now is something that we call a course planner. So if you just give me a moment, I'm going to put that here for us to share. And I just want to show that, um, now let's see, uh, Maria or Michelle, can someone confirm for me that you see the remote delivery course planner? Yes, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. I wasn't sure if the uh, presentation was still there. So this is an example of a resource that you can use to get you started in your planning and creating and building uh, before you implement. And the idea behind this uh, resource that was created by my team here in Open Ed is you have to first fill out the first three columns and then using a backward design, match up the, um, the technology that's going to, to meet your, your learning activity needs, your learning outcomes and the assessment activities. And you're really aligning um, all of those course activities using a backward uh, course design. Now, if you have a hard time with the sheet and you don't know where to start, a tip that I always uh, give my faculty here at Guelph is maybe start off with two things that you currently do in your face-to-face -face teaching that you can't imagine doing without in a remote situation. Take those two and try to map them out. So put them here. Imagine that I really need to have these two approaches in my course. How am I going to get this done? What are my learning outcomes? What are the activities associated with this piece of my course? How do I assess these activities? And then using another um, tool that we've uh, sent you, another resource, matching your pedagogy to your tool. Once you have your pedagogy all set up, you can use our matching uh, pedagogy to tools resource to help you pick the right tools. Now, these uh, resources have been made with the context of wealth and the tool that we have available for our instructors, but the principles underlying these tools and these resources are all the same. And really it's just you then um, trading out the, switching out the uh, technology that you have available at your school for the technologies that we're using here at Guelph. But I find that these two resources, this course delivery plan, uh, planner and the matching your pedagogy will really get you started on your planning, creating and building. We'll talk about implementing in a moment, um, but start with that. So the two things that you can't imagine your course without, and then one more tip, come up with two things that you can imagine doing differently. Put those on the map and see how it, it works out. If you're not able to fill all the columns for the uh, course curriculum or item that you're thinking about, 
that's a signal that there's too much there. Maybe take it out. And, and really keeping it simple and lean will be very uh, helpful. I'll have more to say about that in a moment. So I'm just going to put that off to the side there. Um, we have another uh, uh, resource that I've sent ahead, and it's also about helping you to pick the technologies with a good fit for you. Again, we don't have time to work through all the resources here today, so I leave you the resources um, to work on at your own, um, at your own pace and time. Uh, but there are a couple of others that I want to uh, point out. Uh, the University of Illinois has a great, great uh, index of, um, of instructional activities for engaging students online. And then here in Ontario, uh, all the uh, universities across Ontario work together and we crowdsourced this list of virtual uh, and remote laboratories that you can use. Uh, many of them are, um, are open and free to use with um, um, yeah, a free use. And uh, you can just, you know, access this uh, resource and you'll find lots and lots of um, activities that you can use in your courses. Now, how to. We have some uh, resources to help you with the how to pieces of this. Very practical and helpful resources. Um, so, for example, again, I'm just going to share with you very briefly. These are ones that I have sent ahead of time. But um, if we need to, uh, we won't have time to go through the whole thing. So I'm just going to quickly show you the, uh, the resource was sent out ahead. Again, for those of you who have not received it, we'll make it available after the session. Uh, but here is a resource that's very practical, very light on the equipment, options, and the tips to get uh, your video recordings done. Um, and very helpful. I'll just scroll briefly to give you an idea. It has a bit of a narrative to get you set and uh, in the right frame of mind. It gives you some simple, some impactful, and some above and beyond options, depending on how, um, how, how much you're willing to get into this. It really gives you some really good tips. Uh, it tells you about all the equipment you're going to need. Anyway, very, very um, helpful step-by-step -step, uh, approach. We also have another resource here, Studio. Uh, how to build a studio in your home, a lecture studio. Again, I won't go through the whole thing, but it really just sets up a step-by-step -step, um, list of what you need in terms of planning your background, cameras, um, all the sorts of things that you'll need to, to make this successful using tools and equipment that you probably already have in your home. You don't have to go out and buy a whole lot of expensive equipment. These are things that you likely already have around your home. So I'm going to leave those for you to uh, take a look at some other uh, time. But one thing I do want to share with you is uh, a really great, um, a great uh, resource here that I found. I think this is so wonderful. I'm going to implement. I'm going to build it and implement it in my course. So uh, Google Meets requires me to stop presenting my my um, presentation so that I can show you that um, YouTube video. It's a very quick three minute video. I'm going to play it at one and a half times because we don't really need to hear exactly uh, what she's uh, saying at a slow pace. We'll actually go at a quick pace. And if you just give me one moment, I will get that. And Maria, maybe you can confirm for me that you hear the audio. I can see her. I will wait. In this video, I'm gonna teach you how to build your own light board. Yes, we can hear. Thank you. This is a light board. It's pretty cool. You can draw on it. You can put a little smiley face. Or you can use different colors. So I'm going to draw, let's say, I'm going to make a little kitty. That's a flower. Some kind of flower. Obviously, I'm not an artist. But something like that. You can also use these boards to teach math or any other subject online while facing the camera. Let's do a math problem. All right, let's get started. I'm gonna show you what you'll need to make one of these. The first thing I'm gonna need is a table. You may already have a table at home that you can use, so don't worry too much about your table. The next thing you need is, and you're gonna have to buy this, an acrylic plexiglass sheet. So, of course, I'm going to need some lights. I need some LED strip lights, just like these. To keep everything together, I'm using four shelf brackets and four small C-clamps. The first thing I'm gonna do is tape my LED lights right 
on the table, right in the middle of the table in a straight line. You wanna cover the length of the glass. So in my case, for example, I have a 36 inch glass. So I'm gonna make sure that I have at least 36 inches of LED tape on the table in a straight line. And you want it to be in a straight line because the next thing you're gonna do is place your plexiglass right over the LED lights, just like this. Of course, there are other probably better ways to do this, but I'm trying to keep it easy and simple, like I said. Now that I have the plexiglass right over my LED lights, I'm gonna grab my shelf brackets and I'm gonna place them facing each other with the glass right in the middle, like this. Then I'm gonna use the clamps to tighten everything up. And if you want, you could even screw these shelf brackets onto the table, but I'm not doing that because I feel like this is firm enough for me. Like I said, just trying to make it easy. The last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick some LED lights right up here on the front of my plexiglass just so that I can have some light shine on my face when I'm filming. I just don't have enough, but if I had 36 inches of LED tape, I would put them all over here to cover the length of the glass. So let's see what happens when we light things up. So now look at this. You can see the light shining through. The light is trapped inside the glass. And when we use the markers, the uh, needle All right, and there we go. I'm sorry for the uh, clunkiness of uh, switching between screens, but it's just the way Google Meet works. Um, so that for me is a fantastic example of some light technology, very easy equipment to pick up at your local hardware store, some of the things you may already have at home. So for example, I've already got a piece of plexiglass, I've got a table, so I'm just gonna go out, get the brackets, uh, some LED tape that I've Googled and it's available at my local uh, hardware store. This is a fantastic device for uh, teaching mathematics, science. I teach psychology and for statistics and drawing brains and, and, and pointing to things. It'll be a fantastic and very, um, very reachable uh, kind of uh, tool for you to, uh, to devise. Now, just one thing I want to point out, uh, the woman in the video does mention about flipping your image. Um, I'm going to leave you a, um, a resource here uh, for, oh yes, I just caught in the uh, chat something about painting and exactly for the arts and humanities, there'll be lots of uses for this tool. Very simple and effective, absolutely, I agree. I think it's so fantastic, I'm going to use it in my course. But I do want to caution you about one thing about web conferencing tools. So I actually recommend that you put your computer camera, whatever it is that you're using in a web conferencing tool, if that's what you want to record, behind the plexiglass. You don't have to get into a complicated camera setup like she had. Uh, but you can if you want. Uh, again, it was that asynchronous um, option one to four with increasing um, with increasing complexity, but you can keep it simple. Put your computer on the other side of the uh, plexiglass. But one thing I do want to point out is that many of the uh, web conferencing tools allow you to flip your image, but that's not the kind of flipping that she's talking about in her video. So I caution you, because I'm interested in this, I've already tested it out. Uh, the web conferencing flipping of images is just for you and not for your presenters. So it's just so that your materials don't look odd to you because it is a bit disconcerting if you're right-handed that you look like you're left-handed, or if you're used to seeing the right side of your face that it looks like the left side. So web conferencing tools will do this automatically, but it doesn't do it for your present uh, for your audience, it only does it for the presenter. So I've left you, if you, for example, have a Logitech camera, this is a uh, tool, free tool, that um, you can use. You actually don't even have to use the tool itself, just engaging it will flip the image in the way that she discusses in the uh, video. Now, if you don't have a Logitech camera, look for other similar tools. They'll be available for all kinds of makes and models. Anyway, I'll leave that for you in the uh, presentation slides and send them along after the session. Let's just move on to, um, what about, what about all of this that we've been talking about till, the, till now? Uh, really keeps the student experience engaging, impactful, and, and uh, authentic. What is it? What pieces of our courses do we need to really think about to make it uh, matter and to make it uh, successful? Well, I've done a five-year longitudinal study where I took, uh, in the first year, I compared my face-to-face -face students to my fully online students, the same course. I taught both sections, and then we compared um, a number of uh, factors. And then in the subsequent four years of the five-year longitudinal study, we put all of my students in remote settings, and uh, we evaluated the impact of various online tools and teaching strategies on engagement, 
um, learning outcomes, student satisfaction, social presence, and how much the students felt like they got to know the instructor. Uh, how, you know, did they feel overloaded? Did they feel isolated? So we asked lots of questions, and, and particularly how authentic they felt that the course materials were and the instructor. Now, five years of uh, research, we have lots and lots of data that I won't be able to share all with you today, but I am just gonna highlight a few very interesting findings to, to demonstrate to you how picking some of these low-hanging fruits, the use of light boards, videos, and how that has a very big, big and significant impact on student learning. So let me just show you, for engagement, what kinds of things engages students? Well, in my particular uh, study, I asked students, what particular parts of the course really made them feel engaged? Look at that, whether it was face-to-face -face or online, peer instruction, uh, sorry, peer discussion, they really, really appreciated that communication. So I started off by talking about the best practices uh, in your teaching strategies and how you need to communicate and, and make those uh, opportunities for engagement available to students and make them available often. It really has a big impact on how they uh, feel engaged in your course. In terms of impact, what is it that students think is contributing to their learning? Um, well, in the, in the first year, I compared face-to-face -to, -face to online, so I've only presented the online data here. And then in subsequent years, in year two, we had students uh, who were just in remote. Now, just to quickly identify the difference between the blue group and the red group on this right half of the uh, graph, the blue group, they were students who just got my full lecture, hour-long videos, um, and the announcements were text announcements in the learning management system announcement tool. My second group, they received the same videos but cut into shorter clips. And instead of text announcement announcements, they received a video announcement. So I would come on and say, hi class, um, today we're going to be doing A, B, and C, and I'd really like you to focus on this, that, and the other thing. We have a turn test coming up this day, that day, whatever. And that was it. Posted the um, announcement either by email or in the uh, learning management system. This video message had such a big impact on students, it was beyond anything I could have imagined. And if you look, the, you're going to notice that the red group, which really actually the video clips had no impact on uh, learning or reporting of um, engagement, isolation, etc. What we did find is that the video announcements just made these people overall more, more positive. Uh, about everything in the course. And we found that consistently through the remainder of four years of our study. Um, did they feel isolated? Pretty much a 40 to 60 split across the years, but look at the red group. They report far less isolation. They, they, don't, they don't feel isolated. Again, the only difference here, a quick video message instead of a text-based or written uh, announcement. And it's, it's very low-hanging fruit, easy to accomplish, uh, lots of ways you can do it. Almost, uh, you know, most phones and smart devices will have a quick um, uh, start-stop video that you can then upload to your management system, learning management system, or that you can mail out to students, email out to students. How about authenticity? What about this? makes things feel authentic or real? Well, first of all, we asked students, you know, given that this was a remote course, did it feel real or was it awkward and artificial? Um, interesting, doesn't matter which group, nobody is reporting that it's not authentic. So this to me says, if you try your best, if you really put your best effort forward, you can definitely make a very real and authentic uh, experience for your students. But again, look at the red group, just generally more positive, and we did find this across the study. Uh, last but not least, I just want to point out uh, quickly, again, um, you know, what is it? Okay, so students feel like it's authentic, but what about the delivery of remote courses makes it feel authentic? What is it? What pieces of the course? What types of interactions? And again, um, look at here, the video messaging, the video announcements, big, big um, ticket. Big value, big value for low uh, cost and low effort. Another thing I want to point out, what is it about the course that made them feel like they got to know me as an instructor? Look at this, my video lectures, my lecture videos are rated higher than students actually coming to campus and seeing me face to face. So my remote students did everything online with the exception of tests and exam. They had to present themselves uh, here at the university. 
big impact. Some closing thoughts to leave you with. First of all, let's think about an alternative. It's what I call my alternative delivery mode square, the alternate to your alternate plan. You're already coming up with alternate plans to move uh, remote due to COVID. But what if your plan fails? What if you're going synchronous and something doesn't work? What if this session was to turn off? How would we all connect? So we need a backup to the plan. I'm not saying I don't have any answers for you. I have some ideas, but you really just need to think about that because we're making some big assumptions here. Everything I've talked to, uh, I've talked to and talked about up until now, uh, makes big assumptions about you, the equipment you have, the skills and training and access. We're also making big assumptions about your students and their um, access to resources. Uh, maybe they're in a household with lots of children and one computer, maybe working parents who need the computer. Um, so competition for resources um, might be an issue. If you remember from our uh, introductory slide, from our, our first slide, education for all. You really need to keep in mind who your, who your audience is, who are your students. Um, are they young students who will probably need more help? Maybe consider video and oral submissions for young students who don't have the dexterity um, and capacity to work very effectively in a typing and written environment. So we really just need to keep in mind um, how to present things in a way that students can, can um, succeed and the families too. Keep it simple. Keep it simple for yourself, for your students, and for the families that are supporting the students, particularly the younger ones in the younger years. Keep it short. Use that course planner. Increased effort means increased load for you as an instructor. Map it out. Take that course planner or another resource similar to that and map everything out. If you're not able to align learning outcomes, activities, and uh, technologies and assessments, that to me is a signal. Take it out of your plan. It's too much. Keeping it short in a remote environment, uh, less is definitely more. Keep it consistent. In your face-to-face -face class, keeping things always the same might seem boring. In a remote environment, that is not true. Consistency is not boring. Consistency is predictability. In psychology, predictability means increased learning. Knowing those paths, knowing what comes next, knowing how I'm to behave as a student in your course will increase uh, my success and my learning in your course. That we're here today together in this uh, online live environment, for me demonstrates hope, encouragement, and more importantly, evidence that you too, you too can connect with your students. Keep it, um, keep it simple. Keep it engaging, connect with your students, excite them, motivate them to stay connected to you, to stay connected with their classmates, and more importantly, to stay connected with the learning that you're presenting to them in their curriculum. Now, I want you to take two minutes. We have a couple of minutes. I want you to imagine, how can you do this all? It is a daunting, daunting and enormous task that we have on hand. Well. Maybe not all on your own, but mostly on your own. You do have supports. My suggestion, go for those low-hanging fruits. Keep excited, keep motivated, be willing to try new things. And for me, it comes down to golf balls. I'm gonna do a quick little demonstration for you. And this is based on the metaphor that a, um, a colleague in the US, an economics professor uses with his class. So I'm borrowing the metaphor of his golf ball, jar of golf balls to, um, present to you to imagine imagine that this is your course this jar of golf balls is your course and it's filled and in canada we say don't sweat the small things focus on the big things so essentially the saying is around you know focusing on the things that matter the big issues don't get caught up in the little things so if this is your course first focus on the big items your syllabus your assessments the course outline that map that you need to use to support families and students Keep focused on the big things that matter, the things that you want to do in your in your uh, in your course. Now you start to think that, well, you know, the jar is full. My course is full. How can I possibly start to introduce new technologies, new teaching strategies? Well, if you take care of the big things first, the things that really matter, there's always room for the little stuff. If you start sweating, if you start worrying about the small stuff, then there won't be room for the big stuff. And let me show you how. Well, here I have a, a, um, a little uh, container of jelly beans, so big candies. If I take care of the big things first, there's still some room for some of the small things. And I can pour, 
I can pour more into my course and I can think more, more effectively and I can make room. Now, if I had filled the jar with the candies first, there definitely wouldn't be room for the golf balls, the big things that matter. Okay, now, I'm sure if we could all speak to one another, you would agree with me that, boy, oh boy, this jar is really, really full. Well, I can still think of smaller, more exciting things that I can add. I'll put some popcorn, corn kernels. And just when I thought my course was so full and I couldn't imagine, because I took care of the big things first, I still have some room to think about the smaller things that might matter too, but let's take care of the big first. If I had a cup of coffee, I could still sit and talk to you and we'd still make time and room for some coffee, although I don't want to disturb my, my, um, my example of ice here. Now, now this is so full, I can barely put anything more. If there's still one thing you want to think about for your course, well then consider taking out one of those big things and swapping it out for something more interesting and colorful. Take it out, get it off that map and put something new. I hope that this motivates you to consider questions which have been noted down from the blog and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking that, okay, some of them have already been answered. So I'm not sure what to ask you right now. Uh, but if uh, like one of the things that have been coming up uh, throughout is that how do you engage with students who are from remote and rural communities? And I know that the University of Guelph does have a lot of students who come from the rural communities. So is that something that you could maybe elaborate on, on how, like, you know, the same technologies, how do you adapt them for students who come from very remote locations where there may or may not be continuous internet connectivity or access to technology? Yes, that's a great question, um, and I'll start, and then I know that Lena will probably want to jump in here, um, but absolutely, we have a very robust, uh, fully online program that we have, as I've indicated, we've been in this space for uh, a couple of decades now, and that is one thing that we really um, focus on, is how do we engage individuals, students, who are in very remote regions, or have different types of learning styles or maybe don't have necessarily strong access to internet or um, you know have conflicting priorities they have jobs they have a family to take care of so there's lots of factors that are affecting students especially when they're learning at a distance or remotely um, one of our strategies obviously that we've talked about is is asynchronous so um, designing our learning opportunities that allow individuals to engage with the course at a time and place that makes sense for them. And that's really important when we think about remote instruction because it ensures that individuals who may have um, people living in their house uh, and being active at a certain point in time or their internet is not really great in the morning or in the evening, they, they can engage in that learning at a time and place that makes sense for them. Um, so that's one thing. So asynchronous is one. We, we use lots of different instructional strategies to engage students. So thinking about, um, I know there was a question that came up about discussion boards. So that's a form of engagement, posing questions, having the faculty uh, jump in and, and um, encourage discuss, discussion posing a question, and so that ensures um, that there is ongoing engagement between uh, the students, also between the instructor and the students. Um, so that's one way. Uh, there's technologies you can use, um, depending on the types of platforms, there's various quizzing uh, um, technologies that you can use to engage. Also, um, the uh, video conferencing platforms that you use you can set those up and design that instructional strategy in such a way that you're actually engaging uh, with the students. Lean, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Actually, that was a very comprehensive answer and certainly checked off all my boxes. So thank you for, uh, for that, Michelle. The only thing I would add, uh, and because that is my context, Maria, as you know, I live in, uh, 
you know, rural Ontario with a very, and I'm in a particularly bad pocket. So I'm often in meetings with Michelle and some of our other colleagues and I get knocked out of the uh, session. I teach online, I often get knocked out. So one suggestion I would make for um, both the administrative staff here today and, and teachers is if you have choices amongst the tools, do your research, do your homework. If you don't understand the tools entirely, then connect with your IT professionals. But find out if you have choices in web conferencing tools, as an example, pick the low hanging fruit. Pick the uh, tool that is most efficient uh, with the bandwidth and data. So for example, Google Meets works very well for me. Um, uh, WebEx, not so much. Uh, Zoom works very well. So some tools will work better than others and it's based on the complexity of the tools in the back end and how they function. This is information that's not accessible to you and me in our everyday kinds of practice, but your IT professionals and even the uh, vendors, you might have vendor support. I would contact the companies and ask them, you know, for example, how many frames per second does this particular web conferencing take? If it's much too high, your rural, your rural students and instructors, some of the instructors might actually live in rural uh, areas. They will not have a good, um, a good experience. So I know that Google Meet, uh, Zoom, and um, some of the tools available in uh, D2L, in Brightspace, um, render the information at a very efficient, efficient rate. So picking the right tools for your situation is really important. Thank you. So I have uh, another question, which is on a completely different level. This is uh, from Suman Purohit Das. How do we deal with mood swings or behavioral issues of adolescence in remote learning? Could you please suggest some strategies which we can use effectively? Yes, this is, um, this is something that we have dealt with, especially when uh, many of our courses uh, have moved to remote and uh, faculty are trying to determine how to manage that experience and manage that environment. So, um, Lena and I've talked about it at great lengths. I'm actually going to let Lena answer this because um, we use Zoom quite a bit here in, uh, in, uh, at the University of Guelph. And so we've developed some strategies and supports for faculty to think about how to manage that experience. Maria, can I just have you clarify, because I did not hear the first part of your question, uh, what part of behavior that we're trying to manage? Can you just clarify that again for me? Uh, the question is, how do we deal with mood swings or behavioral issues of adolescence in remote learning? Yes, so, uh, yeah, very good question. That's what I thought it was, but I just wanted to clarify and make sure I had heard that right. Um, you know, it, at the end of the day, uh, I teach. I teach adults, though, so children is a different, um, a different scenario. Uh, I think it's, it's all part of classroom management, and it's no different in the remote situation as it is in the, um, the face-to-face -face, uh, situation. You need to manage your class. You need to set your expectations very clear, clearly out front and at the beginning of the course. I think um, often what I find with students online is they take certain liberties. And because we're behind a screen and behind a camera, maybe they think that they can have mood swings and, and misbehave. Um, we've certainly heard in the media here in Canada, and I'm not sure if you've heard uh, there in India, um, something that we're calling Zoom bombings. And so students who come into a web conferencing um, session and, and misbehave terribly. Uh, there are ways to avoid this. Uh, first and foremost, um, making your expectations of behavior clear, just as you would in your face-to-face -face class. Uh, presenting a course honor code, uh, presenting students with a code of honor that they must uh, agree to at the beginning of, of a course often helps. Um, sometimes just seeing that course honor code posted in the uh, learning management system is sufficient. And if you go to our um, resource site that we've uh, invited you to um, to, to borrow some of the resources there, we actually have an example of a course honor code. And research, education research shows that if students are presented with that ahead of time, they, it mitigates some of their uh, behavior. A couple of other possibilities, when you're using these uh, web conferencing tools, if that's one of the choices of tools, uh, set up the security in such a way that you're only, allow only allowing invited students to come in. 
Um, if we are to share the links, a lot of these tools can be made publicly available. And it's unfortunate that Zoom has taken a lot of the brunt of the bad uh, press out there about Zoom bombings, but it really is just a, you know, a matter of convenience for the other vendors. And I don't think um, you know, Zoom bombing rolls off the tongue very easily. Microsoft Teams meeting bombing doesn't roll off our tongue so well, but they have the same exact problems that all of these platforms have. Um, this is not a problem just to Zoom. This is true of any uh, online uh, environment that you set up. So really it's mitigating the class management um, as you would face-to-face. -face. A course honor code helps. Put those security checks in place, sharing only the link with your students and be very clear in your communication with your students that they are not to share that with their friends. The family perhaps, especially if they need parental guidance in logging into sessions. So it's really about setting the parameters. During a session, if it's a student that belongs in your course and they're misbehaving and being moody, um, then I would deal with it the way I deal with it in my face-to-face -face class. I will call it out. In a remote environment, though, we have a tool that you don't have in the face-to-face -face class. I can mute them. I can close their, their, their speaking tool. I can't close their mouth in a face-to-face -face class, uh, and that's not actually encouraged. I'm not to touch students. But in a remote environment, I can mute them, I can hide their video, I can remove them from the classroom, likened to sending them to the principal's office. Um, so I have some actually controls that make my classroom management much easier. Anyway, that would be my tip. Thanks, Lena, that is very true. And uh, Dr. Gupta, I think you have a question. I have a question. First of all, I would like to thank Lena and Michelle for such a wonderful session. And listening to Lena, it is like a global problem of uh, handling the students. I think all across the world, the students are the same. And uh, fortunately for all these uh, uh, technology companies, we are able to use Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, Zoom as the platforms here in India as well. And most of us as educators in our schools are using these tools. Now, my question to you is that the instructional strategies, of course, have been upgraded. And um, uh, we like it or we don't like it. Technology is here and it's here to stay. Probably not in this form, but also in the hybrid form. What I want to know from you is that while the instructional strategies have changed, how have the assessments changed? Have you already planned to assess in a different manner? What are the changes that are coming in the assessment? And how can we assess the uh, skills and competencies along with the knowledge and the understanding of the children through the online platforms? So that's a great question, and uh, it's um, it's something that we've been uh, working with faculty on thinking um, differently about assessment because uh, in some cases, in many cases, faculty are very much used to having final exams where they sit down. There's written work, um, and that's and. Um, they've, they've got an invigilator in front of them, and that's the only way they know how to assess. So what we've been, um, that is absolutely one option, and there are technologies that will facilitate invigilation in an online environment that we use um, uh, quite a bit at Guelph. However, there are, and we encourage faculty to think about other forms of assessments, such as, um, uh, you know, uh, group projects perhaps, or a major paper, or some sort of independent project. We also leverage the tools that we have um, such within our learning management system, such as um, we have a, a video note tool that allows um, students to upload videos. So if they want to evidence uh, the achievement of some competencies or some skills, they can create a video of, of themselves or a video of them demonstrating that they've achieved those skills and upload it into the environment. So there are um, innovative and creative ways that we can assess the achievement of, of outcomes, the, assess the achievement of skills and competencies without actually having to do that formal sit down final assessment or multiple choice assessment, whatever it is. Those are some strategies. Uh, Lena, once again, I'll let you jump in. 
Thank you, Michelle. Uh, again, Michelle, you've probably hit on a lot of the, um, the items I would have uh, discussed, but I do want to share from my own personal uh, experience. I've been teaching introductory psychology and second year psychology for 28 years, and I am that person who does multiple choice testing in an invigilated room with proctors walking up and down the aisles. So I am, uh, I, I feel that I'm one of the people that, that Michelle and I speak to every day here on campus at Guelph. Um, for me though, it I take it a step further. Uh, some of the data I shared with you here today, I use my tests and exams uh, for scholarship of teaching and learning research. Uh, so for me, it's uh, frightening to think, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this online? I cannot put my tests online, it compromises my research. Um, so now I really have to think, I ne really need to, um, you know, uh, practice what I preach. Uh, I need to think of different types of assessments. Michelle has already touched on a few take home exams, uh, group work, group submissions, uh, video. Video assignments are wonderful, particularly for young children. And I know that we're talking mostly K to 12 here today. So I really, really um, hope that you'll consider some video assignments, particularly for the younger students who don't have that uh, dexterity and, um, and um, you know, capacity to write uh, and, and demonstrate their knowledge through writing. So video is a very powerful tool. I think my data on the video announcements is evidence enough. It is so impactful uh, and can have a very positive outcome for you and for students. Um, one example that I am going to try uh, this year, actually I'm going to give you two examples. Um, I, in my classes, I use clickers, student response systems, and it was in one of my tables as one of the possibilities that you can use uh, in an online class and a face-to-face -face one. So when you go hybrid, you'll need to consider what activities am I doing in class and what activities am I doing remotely. But for now, we're entirely remote. I did send ahead an article on clickers in the classroom, but that is also clickers in remote. So you can use response systems. Uh, to collect assessments and, and feedback from students. Um, you don't have to use the physical clicker in the classroom. And have a look at that article I passed on to you, Clicker Way to an A. And it really demonstrates how powerful these engaging uh, tools can be, even in a remote setting. It doesn't have to be just for the face-to-face. -face. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have um, students working collaboratively, like they would with clickers in the classroom, but in online situations. And rather than just answering the questions on my tests, I want them to answer the questions, submit their answers using a quizzing tool. But for me, I'm not going to manage whether they're cheating or not cheating, whether they're collaborating when they should or they shouldn't. Instead, I'm going to have them do an additional written assignment and tell me what did they learn by writing my test. So I really don't care whether they get 100% or 50%. But I want them to now describe in a short narrative, what did they learn by taking my test? And they can't possibly cheat on that because they can only tell me what they, they think they know and what they don't think they know. Um, so that's one approach. The other approach is um, when I pivoted my course back in March when COVID um, was at least the biggest problem and initial problem here in Ontario, uh, what I did, uh, I wasn't able to give my students a final exam, so instead I gave them a real world scenario. Here we are today with COVID-19. And I asked them, my final exam would normally assess all of their understanding in the course, covering all the chapters of the text. So I did a take home exam. I told the students they could keep it open book, use the book, look through it, peruse it at their leisure, and come up with any and every possible explanation in my introductory psychology text that could help explain our situation currently in COVID. I didn't care what part of COVID they selected, whether it was, are people adapting well? How do we teach online? How do we work? How do we manage family? How do we man manage mental health? They could pick whatever topic they wanted and then pick uh, a number of areas, um, psychological concepts and areas that would help describe. Again, a very easy assignment uh, that they couldn't possibly cheat on. It really, you know, was what their understanding of the current climate in our, um, in our province was, and then connecting what they learned in the course to that. So just two examples of what you could possibly do. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to come back to, we're getting a lot of comments and a lot of, 
uh, questions about the how to manage where students don't or your student population does not have any resources including uh, like you know internet including maybe a cell phone at home or a computer at home so would you have any suggestions for schools which are working with underprivileged audiences Absolutely, Michelle, maybe I'll start off with that, this one, and if you have some ideas, please jump in. Um, I have thought about it. Well, I have no answers because the context really depends uh, specifically to your teaching or administrative context. I do have some ideas around this, and I have been thinking about it because I myself am in a bad uh, uh, pocket for connectivity. Uh, but even more importantly, families uh, who come from um, impoverished environments where they may not have any connectivity, and you really have to think of the whole gamut. Um, as our introductory slide uh, mentioned, education for all. So a couple of ideas that I have, um, let's start off with maybe they have some connectivity, but the competition for the resources are so great because it's a large family, there's few uh, options for equipment in the household. Um, well, first of all, maybe consider when we're developing resources for our remote courses, check to see that it's visible on a mobile device. Is it adaptable to a mobile device? Because not everybody has a computer. And in fact, I didn't bring the statistics with me, but I came across uh, some statistics the other day that um, uh, demonstrated that of the 8 billion plus people in the world, approximately 6 billion have access to cell phones, just above 4 billion have access to toilets, and far fewer have access to computers. So many, many more people have mobile devices, far fewer have computers, and we need to keep this in mind. I'm not suggesting that you create everything to be mobile friendly, because that does take a lot of effort and, um, and knowledge and skill sets uh, that we might not all have. Um, and we might not have sufficient resources to develop all of that um, for everything that we're doing. But maybe where you can, those low hanging fruits, make sure that it's uh, viewable on a mobile device. Um, if there really is just no connectivity, let's say there's lots of power outages in, the, in a particular area, then I think it's uh, one possibility, something I have been thinking about is perhaps creating um, safe environments, safe environments with social distancing where students can help students, either by sharing notes. Um, I mean, you have to think about the health and safety of this, but if you have no power, you have no computer, we still need to educate. Um, and one way might be using the power of the masses. So if you, you're only one instructor, but you have 20 or 30 or 15 students, perhaps you know getting a volunteer to uh, take the lead on, well, I'm gonna help my classmates who don't have access. And whether that's through a note taker, whether it's through someone who can put something in the mail, maybe you as an instructor will have to make your, your um, your uh, curriculum and, and activities available as you know we did in the old days through correspondence and put it in the mail. I'm assuming that the post office is still functional. Certainly here in Ontario, we have mail services still continuing. And while it seems very old school in a digital environment where we've progressed and moved so far ahead, we do need to keep in mind that there will be pockets of students who absolutely need to um, to have access to hard uh, materials and not only soft copies. Michelle, I don't know if you have more to add to that. Uh, it, it is a tricky question and a tricky situation. It is absolutely, and uh, you know, one that we absolutely face here as well. And I, I guess the only thing, and it's kind of a, uh, what you were talking about in terms of making things available in print, is that if a faculty member, if an instructor is um, delivering their lecture using um, you know, Zoom or another, if there's, um, you can create a transcript of that recording um, and then send the transcript, the printed transcript to the students so that they can then um, get that, um, get that lesson in a different format. So um, very, very much aligned with what you were saying. So uh, we're kind of running out of time, but I think this is a very unique question. So I'm going to uh, just leave this out there because I think it's something that needs to be addressed as well. Uh, Ma'am, when we post our video lectures, uh, students end up making memes of us. How do, we, how do you handle that? 
Did you say memes? Yeah, memes. Well, I, I feel quite strongly about this, and Michelle and I have discussed this quite often. Uh, so, Michelle, I'll just throw in my answer, and please, you know, uh, give me your opinion. I very early on, so I've been doing online teaching and remote teaching for about 17 years now, and it took me about the first few months to just get over it. Students will make fun of me in the class, and they'll make fun of me online. And at the end of the day, my intellectual property is mine to have, but mine to give. And I'm more about being transparent and open and sharing uh, rather than trying to keep it close um, and keeping my cards to my chest. Um, at the end of the day, um, yeah, you know, there could be some pretty funny situations out there and I'm okay with it. I've just learned to get over it and um, just know that that happens in the classroom too. When I'm lecturing to uh, large classes, uh, there's nothing stopping those students from recording me using their cell phones, and I know that. Um, so it really is, and it's that comfort level. I spoke about it in the tips that this isn't for everyone, and it really is about overcoming our fears of being out there, um, listening to ourselves and seeing ourselves. Our students are already listening and seeing us every day in the classroom. Uh, so it really is just a comfort thing, and you really just, for me, I just had to get over it. And if I'm not able to laugh at myself, it's not going to be a fun, long life. <laughs> and I also think, um, just to add to that, I agree with uh, what Lena is saying, but I also think, um, as we talked about earlier, code of conduct, that um, initial contract that you have with your students that you set up, you know, clearly lay out the expectations that you have of your students in terms of that type of behavior. Um, it, it may not prevent it entirely, but um, hopefully it will go a little way to uh, supporting how that instructor or that uh, teacher wants to engage with the students. Thank you. Uh, seeing we're reaching the, we've pretty much reached the end of our time, so I would like to call on Anjali Ma'am. Ma'am, are you here? Ms. Anjali from COE Chandigarh? Yeah, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. I'm over to you for concluding remarks. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this, uh, for inviting me for concluding remarks. And uh, I must thank uh, Lena and Michelle for this wonderful, wonderful session because, and I feel the best part of this whole session was the question answer session. They have given us such practical answers which are doable. And these questions, we are, since we are also doing a kind of remote uh, teaching uh, while doing our online sessions for teachers since uh, April, uh, so we are also facing this same kind of situation, though we are involved with peers only. The teachers are trained. There also we witness so many things which uh, raises question and uh, the answers we have got today are really, really doable. We discussed that uh, we need to be open-minded. Planning comes first. You need to be very thorough with the planning, and the teacher, uh, students must know what they are, what we are going to expect from them. So that part is very, very important. We need not uh, be involved in our. Uh, emails and remove all the distractions we need to be very focused as teachers for online classes also as we do in our regular classes uh, we key, need to keep interacting even in our online teacher training also we have seen that uh, the trainer who is interacting who is involving all the participant are more successful and are more appreciated than those who are only reading through ppt or showing videos and not discussing much because uh, i'm sorry it got muted uh, am i audible yes ma'am you are audible so uh, then we discussed about various uh, resources available which are also very very useful uh, the jam board in google we can use and other whiteboards where the students also feel it, they find it fun also when they discuss and get involved in new kind of technology so that is one in interesting thing we discussed and uh, i was reading in the chat box also people were really appreciating uh, uh, the video messages idea which uh, lena has given that teachers can send video messages which are very very effective 
uh, and then all the positivity and at the end that uh, full jar with room for small things and big things that is really practical and very very encouraging and motivating if we take care of big things small things fit in they are all automatically taken care of we can just keep pouring our small issues when uh, we take care of big things like curriculum and at uh, the assessment part i really like the idea uh, of open book text testing that is very very interesting for the students also because they don't feel that they are being uh, into regular and uh, grilling part of assessment so they enjoy that ki hamare ko kitab khol ke test karna it's a new thing for them so we need to be very very innovative with our uh, assessment part we need to be uh, very very creative and very very uh, we need to explore many dimensions of assessment uh, which lena has also discussed and many art of our teachers who are also doing and at the end i would like to say that uh, we are saying that students should uh, we should involve uh, students and give them group task and all these things i feel we should involve all the teachers as principals and as administrators also we should uh, hold hands uh, with the teachers also and we should ask them also to hold hands with each other and share their um, experiences so that all the problems which they are facing can be sorted while discussing with each other because discussion is the best thing to reach to anything any any good new innovative ideas so i i found this whole discussion very very encouraging motivating and uh, i feel we can do anything if we are little creative and innovative and uh, as ma'am said uh, if we are ready to overcome our fears if we are ready to laugh at ourselves like you were talking about memes so that happens in regular classroom also so we need to be uh, have that ability to laugh at ourselves we need to be very very innovative creative and at the same time very very um, positive about uh, the things we are learning now in this difficult situation thank you maria ma'am uh, for having me thank you lena and michel once again for this encouraging and motivating uh, session thank you very much thank you and uh, thank you once again michelle and lena thank you anjali ma'am and that uh, is the end of our session thank you everybody for joining in thank you very much for having us thank you thank Bye. you very much